Hi. Sometimes you learn something new. Sometimes your brain just goes boom, and the world expands and, and stuff happens that you never thought could happen. This happened to me recently. I'll show you what happened, just to say. Because this is a Q&A. I got an email from Julian in Germany. And um, it's a Q&A about 40k, I guess-ish. Um, it's about the wonderful world of bolt action 40k. Which apparently is a thing I didn't know. So my brain just absolutely blew. It, it melted out of my ears. I, I, was, I was gobsmacked when I read this. Let me just read it to you. I guess we come from very different angles, but meet very close together on common ground. That is why I'm so grateful for your channel. Thank you. Um, happy you, you enjoy it. Me and my friends are writing and playing extensive house rules to run a 40k campaign with a modern bold action rule set. That is an amazing idea. That is a really cool idea. Um, <laughs> um, one of the things that sort of ended my career in 40k, because I was playing it in the bad old days where Jet Seer Council was the thing, right? One of the things that ended it was the codex creep and the how how competitive it ended up being where you had to sort of buy the news thing to to be in the competition and and bold action is much better in two regards for me in the competitive sense because it doesn't change all the time and you don't have to buy the newest thing in order to compete there are other issues with it of course the stale meta and and the fact that some things are just better than others but with few adjustments, I think, uh, but, so so that's the competitive side. On the non-competitive side, I think bold action is just an easy rule set where it, it handles infantry combat really well. Um, easy and quick, uh, like 40k did. And the game length is similar, and the game tables are similar in many regards so i think it's an easy fix to jump from one to the other and if you're running 40k one of the things that i found with 40k was i once i shifted to bold action i was amazed at how beautiful the tables turned out to be which is something that i'm seeing less and less of in games workshop games right the tables are becoming more and more minimalistic the armies are still beautiful the, the models are still beautiful yes but but the the game tables have become more and more boring, um, and that is not true for, for bold action. So there is a lot of stuff if your main focus is on on doing house rules and and doing what you think is fun. There's a lot of good stuff to to get for bold action. And of course, finally, the dice draw from the bag. It's just an amazing way to engage all the time instead of the I go, you go system. Um, it's, it's just much, much better. Right. So rules analysis is critical if you want to jump from 40k and, and into bold action. Basically, every part of it, from point efficiency up to and including nasty competitive shenanigans. Yes, I agree. Um, and I think that, that you're going to have to do so much work um, that this is going to be a little bit difficult um, if if you want to translate all 40k into bold action. Um, it's going to be difficult. It's not going to impo be impossible, but it's going to be difficult. And one of the, the main focuses that you need to sort of think a little bit about is how much do you want the units to synergize with other units because that is a thing in 40k it's not a thing in bold action um, not a lot anyway it's very rare that you have uni units that have effects on other units but it is a thing in 40k and it's actually a thing that I miss from 40k um, so if you can get that to work I'm really interested in hearing about that 
Um, but since you're not real for uh, we're real bold action players, nor really 40k players anymore, we are lacking in this area and happy for your expert view. Happy to give it. Um, send me what you've got. I would be happy to read it. Um, and maybe see if my competitive brain can break it and so you can fix it uh, after I've broken it, right? So, and and he finishes off, Julian, I guess that makes us somewhat the rivet counters of the 40k universe. That is an amazing comment. That was really what just melted my brain. And I, I, I didn't know that there were rivet counted 40k players. That, that, I didn't even know that that existed. Um, but of course it does. Of course it does. Some players would want a game that is as fair and balanced as possible, that's fun and still just has uh, interesting decisions and has a lot of the theme. And the, the Games Workshop 40k with uh, Warhammer and Warhammer 40k, it, it is an amazing setting that, that really has a lot of people engaged with it. So yes, of course, I, I completely get that. Um, I think once I got off 40k, that was one of the things that I was missing the most, that engagement with uh, the, the world that you were building. Um, of course, I also missed the competitiveness, which is why I shifted to bold action. But So, I really like this, uh, this project. Um, let me hear more about it at some point. Now, the, the most, the goal here is, in contrast to competitive players, our goal is not to use the rules for maximum efficiency, but to remove or rewrite part of the rules that feel too artificial, so that decision making comes from a role playing perspective and not the rules themselves. I completely understand that. Um, and that is one of the things that I really love about bold action, because you are sort of making decisions all the time and if you can get those decision to be decisions to be um, um, sort of role playing from the general's point of view or for the unit's point of view that is that is really cool um, so there are a lot of things that i would suggest that you start by doing um, let me just say that um, once you, you're going into that rule set. But right now, I'll just go over your questions. So I've got a lot of ideas immediately. My brain just exploded with ideas for what you can do um, if you're rewriting the rules um, to make it a sort of 40k slash bolt action hybrid. Uh, <clears throat> but right now, I'll just try and answer your questions for this, Julian, okay? So, I wonder, how do you handle the multidimensional topic of casualties? Wonder how casualties affect your gameplay in different ways and how much you take them into your planning. Interestingly, they affect the players quite a lot before they even happen and affect them even more without happening at all. Just might be even possible. Yes, yes. So, so this is the premise for, for what I'm going to talk about today. Look at all of that. All of what I've just been talking about was just the introduction, basically, because here comes the questions. Question one. I think, I'm not 100% sure, that what interests me the most is how you pre prevent uh, being reactive in the face of possible casualties. How do you prepare for them in your game plan? And how do you play high skill competitive games? How both sides handle casualties and setbacks from the game plan since both players will be partially successful. Now, there are like a few elements of this. One, being reactive in the face of casualties is a psychological reaction. Um, that is you being afraid of losing your models. That is just something you're going to have to get over because um, it's not built into the systems. Um, it is a little bit built into the system for bold action in close combat, because because close combat in, in unlike 40k, close combat in bold action is exceedingly deadly, because whoever loses gets wiped. Um, so I would suggest um, for you guys to rewrite that into something that makes a little bit more sense. It, it's extremely deadly in. in in bold action. 
Um, how do I pre prepare for casualties? Well, for one thing, I don't get attached to my models. So just psychologically, I know that they're just plastic models. They will, they will get up and, and walk again next time. That is me being not role playing. I'm being a competitive player about this. <clears throat> so that is one thing. Another thing is, I would always, if even if I was role playing, building an army as a role player, I know that casualties are going to occur. I know that some of my men are going to lie down and whine and have to be taken to the back to the hospital. So <clears throat> one of the things that you know is you have a, a, a certain role that you want your unit to perform. And in order to perform that, they're going to need to have enough bodies to perform it and no more than enough. So for me, in bold action, for instance, um, backline units need to be as small as possible. Um, that typically in bold action means five men, um, possibly with a, a longer range weapon, right? Um, if I'm going to go pushing a little bit up skirmish units, um, then I'm going to have to have six to seven men. Um, and if I'm going to be an assault unit, I would want there to be seven to eight, maybe even more uh, men in that unit. So I think you should think in, in those terms of, of size of the units, because you're going to suffer some casualties before you become effective. Um, in a backline unit, you're, you can be smaller because you're not going to suffer that many casualties. The enemy's ability to reach out and, and hurt you is going to be limited by the range. In the skirmish unit, you are going to suffer casualties. You are going to have to move, and that means getting up, running to that next cover, and you will suffer casualties while doing that. So you're going to have to have a few more extra bodies in that unit. Um, and then for assault units, you're definitely going, because you're going to go and dig out the unit, the enemy. So you, you have to be beefed up, you have to be armoured, you have to be veteran, you have to be really good in close combat, all of that has to be set. And then still, you're going to have to take a few casualties. That's one of the, the most amazing things about bolt action is um, the target reacts, it will shoot you. And if you fight simultaneously, it will also hurt you. So, so they, they will fight you back. Um, whereas sometimes in, in 40k I had the experience of, of basically being able to strike an opponent without them being able to strike me back or, or I had, you know, armor saves enough that they couldn't really hurt me so that, that happens, right? Um, so in competitive games I make sure that my units have, to have the right size that I don't get attacked by models um, and then the, the next thing is redundancy. If you have one unit that has this capability, why not have two? Because you're going to lose one of them. That always happens in competitive games. You're going to lose some of your units. The enemy is going to try and kill you. Um, and they're going to try and stop you from doing what you want. So some of your units are going to die. Um, so for me... One of the most important things, and that is what maybe also lacking in normal 40k, is in normal 40k you will have like one of that and one of that, and um, that was at least how I played it. Right? It's a long time ago. Don't don't hate me. Um, so so redundancy is actually a thing that that can help you in bold action. I don't know how much it helps you in, in 40k anymore, but when I played it, it was more about synergy. So having the right units with the right characters in them um, to do what you wanted to do. Um, that Because that's it's lessened here, redundancy becomes way more important. Basically, bold action is playing with Imperial Guards and Orcs all the time. You have large units um, and you have to have many of them. Right. Um, and I think that actually could work really well for 40k as well, doing that thinking that. But that does mean that you're going to have to um, lower the, the points costs so that you can take a lot of different units, a lot of infantry, basically. Make sure infantry is really cheap in your system and, and you can take a lot of it. Um, and you have to take a lot of it for some reason, right? 
um, because it's important. Infantry is what's fun. Um, yeah. Question number two. The list building is certainly an important part of point efficiency redundancy, but still, estimating the right size of units must take casualties into account, and it does. Um, will the assault elements two through one, two or three units? How many units will arrive? Combined arms is another aspect, since sometimes one unit dies and another friendly unit thereby loses some of its effectiveness. Um, that combined arms thing, that's mostly a 40k thing, but I really think you should continue with that, yes. Um, it's one of the things that I really love um, about 40k, um, is the, 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 the ability to synergize different units together. Really like that. It doesn't happen as much in bold action, I think it should happen more. Um, and yes, I think unit size is uh, an important aspect. I think if you're building that system, I think you should use more or less what I just described. So backline units can be, your units basically should range from five to 10 man with some horde units maybe being 15 to 20. Um, but those horde units should be really bad at shooting and should be um, okay-ish in close combat, but mostly should just be there for bodies, right? So, um, orc boys or goblins or what have you, right? Uh, like, huge swathes of just bodies to be removed by your heroes. Um, I think the right size for an assault element should be around 8 to 10 men. Um, and they should be in some sort of armor and should have special rules and maybe even be, you know, close combat demons, whatever, whatever you're building, right? Um, for me, that's not the most important aspect. I think, I think whatever you're doing, you should downgrade the points for infantry in 40k, so that it becomes really cheap, and um, and make sure that you have a limited supply of uh, vehicles, um, tanks, uh, big robots, whatever, um, demons and and stuff, and characters. But I think these two, the, the vehicles, the robots, um, and the characters should be there, because otherwise it's not 40k anymore, right? Um, but I don't think you should lower their points. I think you should limit how many of them there are, um, because that makes them more important once they are there. And I think their main importance should be the synergy they have with other units. Question three. The execution of a chosen game plan is surely affected by casualties. Are there triggers when you drop certain goals? When does a unit choose to go down instead of following the game plan? How much math are you doing while taking fire and starting a maneuver in one area of the table? How and when do you trade units? Wow, that's a lot of questions, a lot of different ones. Are there triggers for when you drop certain goals? Yes, of course there are. Um, but there are no goals in bold action that are not more important than my guys. I'm sorry, life is cheap in World War II. Um, for the, the individual grunts, if I need to take that objective and I am desperate, I'm going to try and do it, and it may cost them their lives. Just run at it. Take the objective. Um, and uh, go and watch my videos on suicide vehicles, for instance, suicide trucks. Um, I will gladly sacrifice some of my units in order to achieve goals and that's because i'm a competitive player that that's what it is um if you're going to role play then who would ever want to drive a truck straight at the enemy just to block them that is insane that that's just insane that's suicide um nobody does that so and and i i'm not sure how to make a rule set where you avoid that um it's remember, even though you're, I know you, you want this to be role playing decisions, remember that this is still a game. The decisions that should be fun and interesting should be the decisions for you. Right? You as the player, not as the general or whatever. You, you need immersion enough, of course, but, but the decisions you make should be interesting and fun for you. Um, when does a unit go down instead of? of keeping up with the maneuver and the game plan. I go down with units when that is more beneficial than actually doing something else. And most of the time I'll go and ambush first 
and then I will lure the enemy into firing at me, and then I'll go down, trying to survive. Um, because pulling out shots from your enemy is really beneficial, because he's not shooting at something else that he can actually kill. So going down in bold action is a real thing. That, that should happen quite a lot. It's an important tactical decision. Um, but once you get to the end game, there are, there's also a decision where you know you're going to have to at some point go grab those objectives or run into the oppo opponent's deployment zone. At some point you're going to have to do something and risks will have to be taken. So for me, going down, staying alive is important in the early game and when you are on the objectives. But there is a certain point in the game where you have to take the risk. And there are certain units that have to take that risk more often than others, assault units especially. How much math are you doing while taking fire? Uh, quite a lot. Um, I do uh, calculations, risk calculations, almost all the time. Um, and they, they go so quickly in my head that they've stopped being calculations by now. They're just being, I know that amount of fire, I'm going to suffer one, two casualties. That's it. Um, so once, once you play the game enough, that simply becomes second nature. That happens all the time. Um, And, and sometimes I will deliberately say, okay, I'm going to take one or two casualties, that's fine, I charge. Um, and that's because I know the, the limits to where the, the um, for instance, my I, I often run Gurkhas, right? In 40k terms, Gurkhas would be the best assault unit that you get, right? Um, I don't know what that is in 40k anymore, but it's it's the best close combat unit you get. That's possibly some kind of hero or demon, big special character or something. Um, they are the best in close combat. I know how many enemies they can take on, ish. How many am I supposed to kill? That that is sort of pretty easy to calculate because. Um, if my opponent is regular, then 50% of my hits will be a kill, right? And that's because we don't have the extra layer of saving throws in bold action. And I would suggest that if you switch over to a hybrid of bold action 40k, I would suggest actually bringing that along. So your armor would basically just be, uh, your veterancy would be your armor and whatever else you have, removing the saving throws. Um, unless you're really attached to them. Because the same with those, that, that pushes everything again, right? How, do I, how and when do I trade units? I never try to trade units. I only trade upwards. That's why I'm winning most of the time, right? I don't trade units, not one-to-one. -one. Nope. Unless, there is one circumstance, Unless it's units that can't actively score points for the game. So competitively, that's what you do. Sometimes you would sacrifice a unit. And not expecting to get anything back from it. Just sacrifice it to do one effect in the game. That happens. But uh, trading one-to-one -one units. So I assault you, then I get shot to pieces and die. That's not worth it. It's better just to, to shoot from cover and shoot from safety than to, to do something where you put yourself at risk. Um, and that is actually something that we've been actively training to stop doing in my team. So that's a training issue. Question number four. What is more important, achieving or not losing or making the enemy lose and or letting the enemy not win? Hmm. That is a, uh, I'm not sure I understand this question. Um, is it most important that I win or that I don't lose? Is it most important that the opponent me loses or not win it? Um, that depends. It really does. I think what you're saying is sometimes I will actively try to play for a draw. Um, but that is a tournament thing. That is a tournament thing. 
for for casual games, I think it's just as important just to have fun and have interesting decisions. For a tournament game, I think it's important sometimes to know when you should play for a draw. And that is especially when you're up against a hard counter to your list, then you should play for a draw. Um, hunker down, go on ambush, and just sit there and shoot. Um, because that means that the enemy can't win. Um, also, sometimes it's it's really important to have units that can go and grab objectives in bold action. I guess that would be equivalent in 40k as well. Um, because going and grabbing that objective means that the enemy doesn't win. So that can be important. Yeah. Um, if we're talking still about uh, casualties, then having the opponent suffer casualties in, for instance, close combat, sometimes is really beneficial. So you just throw a unit at one of the Death Star, the, the most expensive units, throw a unit at them, a cheap one, and you know in bold action you'll cause some casualties. You don't know that in 40k, but in bold action you will cause some casualties. So you're you're downgrading that unit. That unit now is less effective. So you can throw two or three at them. Uh, we actually once did an experiment based on on one of our games in my club. I was facing off against a Japanese list with my Gurkhas, and the Japanese player had brought bamboo horde. So the bamboo um, just uh, they're just you know I, I don't know how much you know of this, but but the bamboos are just close combat troops, right? They're pretty crap, but they will hurt you in close combat because they fight close combat. So he charged my Gurkhas in terrain, in cover. I shot him and killed a few, and we fought in close combat. I won the close combat. He charged his second unit in, and a third unit in. Three units. At, at two of the enemy's units charging me, I was combat infected. I was no longer able to charge myself, but I still took on the third unit and beat that in close combat. Um, so there, there is a, a balance to be struck between how many crap units should an elite unit be able to take down before they stop being effective, right? That balance needs to be struck right. And question number five. What can I do when thinking of casualties occupies so much of my planning and thinking? Stop. You should stop. It's just... It's just toy soldiers. Um, this is um, decision paralysis, what you're describing here. It's, it's not that important. I think you should make a system where infantry units, large units of infantry, are more important than heroes. Because if you have decision paralysis, if you're afraid of losing, then that of losing casualties. That that's not just because it's an, an individual space marine or orc. Then it's because it's your hero, and that that hero is important to your game plan. It shouldn't be. Make a system where casualties are just. <laughs> Life is cheap in in the um, in the future universe of forty k. Right? Life is cheap, and it should be. Um, so casualties should just be. You should be taking off hundreds of models models for each game, and you shouldn't be afraid of that. It's when you, it's when you have key models, that's when it becomes important. So in bold action, uh, the only time that becomes important is when one player is running a Death Star unit, a tiger, and that tiger is extremely vulnerable because it's just one unit. He doesn't want to lose that. Um, and then one guy with a Panzerfaust runs up and gets lucky, right, and he dies. That sucks. So I think you should shift the, the game towards being more about large units of infantry, because then casualties won't matter as much. That is my advice. Right, here at the end, I want to ask you, Julian, and all the rest of you, could you please, in the comments, <clears throat> Do I need to make a tutorial about casualties in bold action? When and what you remove? Is that a thing? Do you want it? Let me know in the comments. Right. Thank you for sticking with me for so long in this weird 
and wonderful world of bolt action 40k right cheers